Casper Niebe. Uh, I live in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I founded the, the Polio Polio project um, a while back. And before we start and, and dive too much into the project, there's a couple of things I actually, uh, I always want to, to, um, to pause for a moment and, and uh, just highlight some of the things that, that we actually do. Um, we are not a traditional charitable organization in that we don't position ourselves in the middle of a donor or in between donors and recipients of, of donations. So we, we basically provide a platform that allows donors and recipients uh, to be brought together. Um, we, we don't have access or control of any funds or anything like that at all. So the, the entire idea is of course based on distributed ledger technology. And uh, initially the reason I call it distributed ledger technology and not blockchain is because uh, the, the platform that we based Polio Polio on is actually not a blockchain. It's, uh, it's implemented using directed acyclic graph instead. So you don't have any block producers or um, miners or stakers or anyone else um, that would uh, basically be able to, to censor your transactions um, because block producers are uh, incentivized by, uh, by ec an economic incentive and they will of course pick the transaction with the highest fees or um, if, if uh, we saw it on, uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, that when it clocks up, the fees rise, and once again, the poorest get left behind. So we decided to use a platform that allows us to, to have complete, free, and, and uncensored access to the underlying distributed ledger. And what is always the, the, the popular term, particularly, I've heard it a lot when people talk about Venezuela and, and uh, the current the national currency and inflation and stuff like that uh, it's it's to bank the unbanked or to become a currency uh, and uh, frankly I don't see that happen anytime soon that I can't imagine any government in the world that would allow uh, a digital global coin to become the, the currency in, in their country um, and I've heard a lot about banking the unbanked as well and and that that's of course a, a noble goal, but but most of those talking about banking the unbanked always forget about how to device the undeviced or to connect the unconnected. So so we again get this massive group of people that gets left behind and aren't uh, allowed to benefit from much of this uh, technological advance that we're seeing in distributed ledger technologies, and. I think it's 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 super important also to realize that distributed ledgers, uh, when they were introduced uh, back in two thousand and eight and nine, um, it it really uh, has the potential uh, to to make a massive impact on the world and on a lot of uh, financial systems as we know it. Um, but most of what we have heard and seen so far are basically just castles in the sky. Um, there's very little focus on actually paving the road to those uh, castles in the sky. So we have to, uh, I, I know that it, it, in theory, is possible to create a completely isolated economy um, and, and allow an entire nation uh, to switch to a digital currency that the government can control. But that's not going to happen uh, overnight. So we have to figure out ways on how, uh, of how we go from where we are today to where we want to be in the future. And, and that's some of the things that uh, we try to focus on with Polio Polio. So with that in place, um, I would like to, to uh, talk a bit about how all of this started. Um, I... Uh, by accident, read an article in the New York Times uh, newspaper about a family in Venezuela. Um, basically, it, the article was about the infancy uh, death rate in Venezuela and how it has been skyrocketing uh, because people, a lot of people are starving in Venezuela. 
Uh, and uh, at the time I read about this, uh, I had a, a two-year-old daughter, uh, so it it really moved me to uh, to tears actually when I read that article and about this particular family who couldn't afford twenty dollars worth of infant formula uh, because the mother was too um, uh, malnourished that she, she wasn't able to produce breast milk for the baby. And $20 worth of infant formula was too much for this family to, to afford. And I simply couldn't believe that we live in a world. Um, I, I live in relative safety and in, in a relatively rich country uh, here in Denmark. But I couldn't bear the fact that somewhere else in the world we have these kind of problems. That uh, $20, it'll hardly buy me a, a McDonald's meal. Um, and, and here we have a family uh, having to, to lose their uh, son because of $20. So I decided I wanted to make a donation. Uh, I wanted to find out at least how I could um, make a donation to someone who were focusing on Venezuela. And I, of course, uh, referred to Google uh, as my first option and I was met with lots of warnings. Um, there's a lot of uh, fraud and theft and corruption uh, and uh, for every NGO I found based in Venezuela, there was at least uh, twice as many warnings about uh, uh, not to, to make any donations. Um, and that was, of course, a problem. I didn't feel safe in, in um, because I wanted to help these families. I didn't want to, to just uh, line the pockets of uh, uh, a corrupt uh, government or whatever. So. I, at this point in time, knew a lot about uh, distributed ledger technology, and I, I got my first computer back in 1984, actually, uh, and I've worked with IT ever since. So I knew we had an opportunity to actually make a very big difference uh, in, in situations like this. By using IT and using distributed ledgers, we were, would be able to provide a solution that completely eliminated the, the risk of uh, of interference by the government or um, or theft or corruption in any way at all. So I uh, set up a test. Um, I created three three different uh, wallets of uh, of this OBI platform, and I tested a setup where I was both the, the, the donor and I was the receiver, and I was also uh, staging as a merchant providing a physical product, and I then set up this conditional payment from donor to a merchant, and I confirmed receipt by uh, simulating that I uh, received a product as the recipient, and that locked, uh, unlocked the funds to pay for the product. I'll, I'll dive a bit more into to the exact model later on. So I knew this, this model would actually work. It would be possible. It was painstakingly obvious that we needed to, to somehow provide a far simpler solution. We couldn't expect poor people to, to uh, know about distributed ledgers, uh, uh, let alone have devices that were able to, to run uh, wallets and stuff like that. So with a, a, a clear set of very basic, actually, um, requirements, we set out to build a, a platform that could leverage the, the value of distributed ledgers, but to, uh, to people without devices. And um, even though I'm a developer, uh, or I used to be a developer myself for uh, about 15 years, uh, I hadn't touched a piece of code for about 10 years. So I, I knew instantly that I was going to need help building this. And I have uh, a couple of friends uh, that uh, attended uh, or, or studied at the IT University here in Copenhagen, in Denmark. Uh, and through them, I was put in touch with uh, one of the lecturers there. Um, and eventually, it, it, uh, by coincidence, they were looking for projects that students could work for, um, uh, real, real life projects for companies that had projects that the students could try working on. They were studying scrum models, uh, agile uh, development methods. Um, so I was able to, to actually get a, a full team, uh, six developers, uh, two scrum masters and a, a business coach. Uh, and through a three month period, we were able to build um, a 
prototype of the platform. We also, uh, through another connection of mine, reached out to the Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, and uh, two of the students there who were studying computer science, um, or uh, I think it was a related uh, topic, I can't remember the exact course they were studying. Uh, actually, I think one of them was in agriculture or something like that. Um, but they, uh, um, they uh, joined and, and decided to help um, build and um, scale the platform, so to speak. So, this is uh, the traditional um, charitable models. We have all the donors and we have some kind of charitable organizations. We all know them like uh, Red Cross, UNICEF, uh, etc., etc. And those charitable organizations, they coordinate the efforts by local NGOs or projects uh, like build a well or plant some trees or build a school, stuff like that. And, and those uh, projects or local NGOs are uh, then again relying on uh, some producers of, of physical products or uh, logistic partners who can ship in uh, the products. And at the end, we have the actual recipients. Uh, and as you can see, we have a whole lot of um, people in between the donors and the recipients. And every time money is passed from one um, entity to the next, we have a potential risk of fraud, theft, embezzlement, uh, corruption, stuff like that. Um, we saw it in, in Venezuela where a, a large convoy of, of trucks with medical um, aid was actually prevented access to, to Venezuela at the Colombian border. Um, so, so there's all sorts of problems related to charitable work that, that uh, is, is very, very difficult to solve. But what I knew was that we had the opportunity to actually uh, limit the impact of all of those intermediaries in, in the donations by simply connecting donors and recipients directly through the use of a public distributed ledger. And this can potentially eliminate all of the intermediaries. Though we still like to use local NGOs uh, because, uh, and I'll get to that in just a little while when I explain the model, because we do have a need for people on the ground. Uh, we need people to, to help educate, we need people to help uh, raise awareness, and we of course also need um, local presence in terms of uh, providing stickers for windows, um, uh, you know, physical stickers that, that a shop owner can put up in the window to let uh, people know that they are part of the Polio Polio project. So this is how the actual model now works. We have, um, this is a, a family and they, have a need for some kind of product. In this uh, very basic example, they really want some bread. And they know that there's a bakery in town um, and, and that bakery, of course, has bread. So they go and ask the bakery to, uh, to join the Polio Polio platform and then add a product uh, to the platform. And, and it, it's done pretty much the same way as you would add a product to, to a, a web shop, basically. So, so it's, it's made really, really simple for these shops to add products to the platform. And the products they add to the platform then becomes visible to applicants. And applicants are now able to make a, uh, uh, an application for a donation. So it's not like um, they, they have to uh, actually go and get the bread yet, uh, but, but they apply for a donation of that product. Here in Denmark, we have uh, uh, me in this example. <laughs> I also have the Polio Polio platform, um, or the Obite wallet basically installed on my uh, uh, laptop and on my phone. Uh, and what now takes place is the actual process. First, the application created by the recipients. Um, I can see that as a donor and I decide whether or not I want to make a donation to pay for that particular product. Uh, the payment I then don donate, they are stored 
on a shared wallet. So by knowing the, the provider of the physical product and by knowing the donor, um, I'll show you how it, it works in practice. Um, the, the, the Obite platform can set up so-called shared wallets. And this means that only the bakery and the donor will have access to those funds. But the rules of how those two entities can access the fund and when they can withdraw from the shared wallet uh, is based on a set of conditions. And those conditions are created by the Obite platform. So the, as soon as the funds are donated, and, and uh, it enters the safe, so to speak, or the shared wallet, the, the bakery can actually see it in their wallet. They can see that a donation has been made and they know that they will be able to get the payment once the recipients confirm receipt of the product. So the, the recipients go to the bakery. Um, if the recipients do have a device, they can check their email because they get a notification. Um, but if they don't have access to devices or internet connection, they have to go to the bakery and say, did we receive a donation yet? Uh, and the bakery would be able to see that, yes, indeed, uh, someone made a donation and the funds are currently locked between me and the donor. So the, the recipients go to the bakery and picks up the bread and they log on to the Palio Palio platform and confirm receipt of this bread. That actually triggers one of the conditions that are uh, on the shared wallet. And this condition means that the funds can now be withdrawn by the producer um, or the shop or merchant. Um, of course, uh, as you might see, what what would happen if the recipients never confirms receipt of the product, if they never go and pick up the product? Uh, we have another condition, and that condition is a time-based condition. So 30 days after the donation was made, and only if there was not made any confirmation about receipt, then the donor will get the donated funds or will be able to withdraw the, the funds on the shared wallet. So. In this model, it becomes quite obvious that the only parties who will ever be able to access the funds in the shared wallets are the donor and the producer or the provider of that product. So that basically leaves even Polio Polio out of the equation. Uh, we don't have any access, and that's also one of the reasons that we were able to, um, to get an approval by the Danish Financial uh, Supervisory Authority. Um, it's, it's, it was quite simple, actually, because we don't have access to funds, we don't handle funds, we don't process any payments or anything else. We leave it up to the donors and the producers. And that way, we could quite easily actually get our um, um, confirmation by the Danish FSA that our model is legal. Um, I, I, I am a strong proponent of remaining legal. Uh, that's, that's mainly due to the, the, the thing I, I said earlier about uh, paving the road. We have to, to react to the world we, we are in right now, where we have all sorts of regulatory frameworks and stuff in place. Uh, so in order to actually make a difference and, and uh, take a small step towards the castle in the sky, we need to, uh, to start with where we are now. And right now, in order to become a charitable organization, at least here in Denmark, you are required to have at least the approval of the Danish, Danish um, Financial Institute uh, Supervisory Authorities. So we got that, and that's um, quite interesting. So the key areas where Polio Polio is different than a, than a lot of other uh, projects is that applicants aren't required to own a device or to know about cryptocurrencies or how to convert a digital currency into a fiat currency um, because that's what most of these people will need. They will need to be able to pay rent. Uh, the, the merchants will need to convert as well uh, to, to fiat currencies to pay expenses uh, for products and, and rent and stuff. So. But, but the most important thing for us is that the applicants, those who are uh, the poorest, they won't need a device of, them, of their own. They can borrow a device at the shop or the merchant, 
and they can log into the Palio Palio platform with their own credentials. <clears throat> so it makes it possible for us to provide sustainable donations, meaning that we don't have this uh, massive What's it called? Storing, uh, storing massive quantities of goods in uh, in a single location. Uh, when you have these warehouses where you store the the aid, it's it's often becomes the target of uh, robberies, armed robberies, or theft, or yeah, corruption in any way. So we don't have this this uh, collect collecting of goods in, in large quantities in one place. And what also happens if you hold a truckload of uh, let's say corn flour into a local community uh, of course you help a lot of people who need the corn flour but you might also have uh, small farmers that rely solely on being able to sell corn flour and by holding a truckload of corn flour in distributing that for free you completely eliminate the local community's local trade and and by by injecting funds into the community instead of injecting products uh, we get uh, so-called sustainable uh, donations instead of the other way around. And transparency. Um, you'd probably uh, want to ask the question, but how do I know that uh, the shop owner and the applicant isn't the same person? Well, you don't. And, and that's actually the beauty of it. Um, you can look at it uh, in another way. When you donate uh, $10 to, to Red Cross, uh, how do you know what happens to those $10? Well, most of us, we have no clue what happens to it. Uh, we know for a fact that about a quarter of that $10 goes into administration and, and administrative costs, logistics, um, paying for control, and uh, there's, there's a lot of procurement um, in, in charitable organizations. And, and all those costs have to be covered by people making donations. So at least a quarter of those uh, $10 you donate, they are, are spent by, uh, by the charitable organization itself. If you're really lucky, it's, 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 there's, there hasn't been any conclusive studies on this yet, but roughly about 60 to 70% uh, are expected to reach the actual uh, recipients of the donations. Um, so, so in in our model, we cannot provide any guarantees. We have, and and this is where the local NGOs can come into the picture, because we would like to to have some sort of um, screening of which producers, which mer which shops, and which merchants are uh, offering their products. Um, if we, we also uh, introduce quite a lot of uh, information because it's a public distributed ledger. Everything, every transaction that takes place, it happens in the public. So it's, it's quite uh, obvious that you can um, see if, if something fishy is going on, but it's not Polio Polio's uh, mission to, to prevent fraud from happening. It's Palio Palio's mission to provide enough information and uh, complete transparency, thereby allowing the donors to make an informed decision by themselves. So they uh, will be able to spot if there's, uh, if for example, a small uh, farmer, um, it, it could be a local farm, if they in a matter of a week were able to, by owning only 10 chickens, were able to produce uh, 50 eggs. Uh, well, either those chickens are extremely efficient or something fishy is going on. And, and this kind of information is what we want the Polio Polio platform to, to, um, to show to the donors so they can make informed decisions. And the, the moment that the Polio Polio platform um, decides to make a decision, that's when we introduce ourselves once again as an intermediary that could potentially... Um, be corrupt or uh, have political agendas or anything else. So we want to make this an open platform. And yes, it will, of course, also introduce the opportunity for someone to defraud the donors, but the donors will know exactly who uh, cheated them. Um, and we believe that's at least better than paying uh, 
ten dollars to a local uh, charitable organization that you basically have no idea about who is, um, and they run off with the money. So in the polio polio model, we know exactly who cheats who, um, and that's that's about as as uh, as much as we want. There's another opportunity, and this is um, to introduce uh, a know your customer um, a KYC check to, to verify a user's identity. The, the OBAT platform that we use um, for this project has a self-sovereign identity built into it. So, so it, it, it would be um, possible and it, it will be voluntarily uh, that a producer uh, verifies his or her identity uh, and it would uh, then leave a mark uh, visible to the donors saying this this specific uh, provider of products has gone through uh, uh, an identity verification um, so again we we won't prevent non uh, non verified uh, producers from offering their products but we want to display to the donors which uh, producers were um, uh, did pass the test. And that leads to the transparency of the platform. Um, ITU, the, the IT University in, in Copenhagen where I live, uh, they are one of the leading uh, universities in terms of uh, artificial intelligence. And they are uh, on the edge of uh, all sorts of pattern matching, machine uh, learning, and, and the amount of data we have at hand uh, about products, about donors, about uh, recipients, about shops, frequency of donations of which products, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, it's an obvious case to introduce some kind of AI that would be able to create some kind of score or whatever. Um, if, the, if, if the risk is high, uh, the risk of, of fraud is high in a particular uh, donation, it will be shown. We won't prevent it from happening, but it will be visible to the donors. And it actually works. We have been, uh, since we have people on the ground in Venezuela, we've been able to, to get, gather some pictures from uh, some of the very first recipients uh, that, that um, received products through the Polio Polio platform. And we have both uh, a chicken shop, uh, we have a meat shop, and um, someone providing vegetables. And, and I've been allowed to use these uh, particular images here by the recipients themselves. And of course, also, our project suddenly got a lot of attention. Uh, we were mentioned in a lot of newspapers, articles were written, um, and, and uh, to some extent, I, I I can't help but somehow think, what the hell have I started? Uh, because uh, the the model itself was basically just to prove a point, uh, but as it turned out that it actually worked, um, things kind of exploded, uh, and and with the blockchain for humanity uh, attention and and the award uh, we won last December in in Uruguay, uh, yeah, it, it definitely hasn't made things less hectic uh, on my part, and it's it's really amazing to to see how this project just has started growing by by itself. Um, we we experience uh, the the local shops. Uh, starting to, to suggest new additions, new features that would make their use of the platform easier. And, and we basically have a, a hard time keeping up on everything because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it took us a bit by surprise that, that it actually worked and it, it went so fast as it did. <clears throat> so we tried to solve problems as we go. Um, the project is 100% uh, driven by volunteers. We don't have any funding at all, and we don't need any funding. The operational cost of this project is $60 per year, um, and that's for the domain name. Uh, the rest, uh, I've been able to, to apply our hosting provider, and they provide free hosting. We have a lot of project uh, management tools that we use, and they are provided for free. Um, 
for this project and there's a lot of super helpful people that that wants to be part of this project and help us in, in any way they can. And we are, of course, super grateful for that. We still have um, uh, one unclear legal position to, to get sorted. And, and that's uh, in, in order to be registered as a charitable organization. And in Denmark, everyone who uh, either collects or encourages collection of funds for charitable purposes, they are required to um, to be registered here in Denmark and you pay a small f fee for that. It's, it's uh, not much, uh, but it, it quickly became quite obvious that the two existing models that exist in the Danish legal framework, they don't fit anywhere uh, with us. So um, actually the, the way it works right now, every single application for a loaf of bread or four dollars worth of vegetables would be considered an isolated uh, uh, charitable uh, collection of funds and that would have to be uh, registered individually and and you pay a fee about uh, i think it's 200 dollars uh, in danish crowns uh, worth of that so it's it's quite obvious that that model didn't work at all so our uh, our project was uh, i got in touch with uh, this ISOBRO, it's a, it's a branch organization of all Danish charitable organizations. Um, and they couldn't quite place us. So they uh, sent uh, the case on to the, um, uh, to the Danish uh, National Charitable Board of Organizations. I can't remember the full name. Um, and it, it actually had to go all the way up to the Ministry of Justice because this will require some change in, in, the, in the Danish law as it is right now, or at least, a, at least an addition. Uh, so they introduce a third model <clears throat> apart from the two existing ones. And <clears throat> by obtaining a legal state, status here in Denmark, uh, we are automatically allowed to, to uh, collect funds from all of European countries and the rest of the world as well. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing actually that by introducing this product to the right authorities here in Denmark, we are actually able to, to uh, affect the way legislation works in the entire EU. Um, and, and that I, when we started all this, I knew nothing about legal stuff. I knew nothing about charitable organizations, how they work and which requirements there were. We, we simply had to go as we went. <laughs> and it's been um, a lot of uh, writing, a lot of meetings with uh, authorities. Um, they aren't exactly super IT skilled. Uh, it's, it's quite dinosaur land to answer that kind of um, of, uh, of area, but it's um, they are super helpful, really, and they appreciate uh, the, the the potential of this project and this model. So they they do what they can to help us uh, develop the project and make sure to help us stay compliant within existing legal frameworks. <clears throat> and we also have to uh, to. to keep an eye on what happens on the underlying distributed ledger platform because there's constantly new features being added, new opportunities becoming available and, and it, it introduces a vast array of new opportunities that we would like to introduce but simply just don't have the, the developer resources for at the time being. We have uh, three developers uh, working uh, at their spare time of course besides their studies at ITU, they, they, uh, they work on improving the platform. And there's only so much we can introduce at a time. So, so that's one of the areas where we have to really uh, prioritize what we do and what we spend our time on. And, and that's where uh, project management really uh, comes into play. And we are open to cooperation with everyone. We, of course, need local representation uh, in countries where we want to start out. Um, we, we need uh, the help of local NGOs, at, at least in the, in the beginning. Uh, I expect that uh, sometimes down the road, the project will grow to a size where it will automatically become known uh, to the wider public in, in, uh, in countries where this model could 
potentially make a difference. And I now actually plan to, uh, to show you how it works in practice. Um, this is the Polio Polio platform. Um, can you still see uh, the, the screen? Yeah. Um, as you can see right now, I'm not, not locked in in any way. Donors aren't required to make uh, a profile or a user profile on the platform at all. The donors uh, are our main concern because we know that eventually those will be the shortest uh, uh, supply type of users. Um, I can see the, the most recent applications and, and the, at the top, I can see which products are currently being offered by producers or shops on the platform. I can filter them. That's one of the things that we had to add because we are actually in dialogue with a, with a pharmacy, chain of pharmacies, and they have 150 pharmacies all over Venezuela. And it became quite obvious that if we didn't introduce this kind of uh, filter opportunity, we would ha end up with, uh, let's say we have, um, uh, uh, it could be penicillin, a product called penicillin. Uh, we would have 150 identical products called penicillin. So we, of course, needed a way to filter uh, I want penicillin in Katia. Um, right now, we have um, these products available, and applicants can apply for these. Um, everything you see on the platform is um, clickable. Uh, we have this transparency that I talked about. You can see when was the last time a product uh, a donation was made for this product uh, the past week, the past month, all time. Uh, how many pending donations? There's been a lot of activity with this. It's actually a new uh, shop that joined the platform. We have 18 pending, meaning that someone made an application, a donor saw that application and made a donation, and uh, the the applicant are now uh, the the process is now where it waits for the applicant to confirm receipt of the product. But let us go back to applications. These are the currently open applications by someone. And I can see uh, a little information about uh, the applicant. It's voluntary whether they want to, to uh, provide a picture of themselves. In some countries, we could expect it to be somewhat problematic uh, if, if it's forbidden by law. I can see for this uh, particular recipient, he has received donations uh, previously, obviously also at a time where we didn't have um, any time stamping of the applications. So at some point before September last year, we introduced the possibility to, to track past uh, applications. So these are the past uh, donations made for this particular participant uh, or ap uh, applicant. And <clears throat> when I click this donate button, I now donate $5 worth of uh, this digital currency called Bytes. Um, we rely on the Obyte platform. I'm prompted whether I want to open my wallet. And I'm not having the fastest computer on earth. <laughs> It'll get there eventually. And I just need to pick a, a wallet. Need to have one that actually has enough funds to make the donation. This could have been planned quite a bit better. Uh, there's one. So I end up in this chat and what happens now is that I engage in a conversational um, interface. So people not knowing about wallets or anything, you have to, to look away from what I just did, yes, trying to find wallets and stuff like that. Uh, this, this wouldn't be the case with uh, a regular user. Um, I met with this chat and it says your device has now been paired, meaning that I'm the donor. My wallet is now paired to the Polio Polio platform. And that is required because it needs to set up a shared wallet between me and the one providing the product. And it says, please insert your wallet address by clicking 
this icon and choose insert my address. And I'll do so. I insert my wallet address, send it. Thank you. The contract is now ready. Um, to send your donation, click on this payment request and make sure to review the conditions before clicking the send button. And there's a link here that I can click, simple clickable link. And when I click it, I can see the conditions. This is the address of the shared wallet or a smart address it's called on Ovide. And I can now see the conditions. The first is the condition that tells when the producer of the product or the provider of the product can withdraw. So when he signs a transaction and a lot of mumbo jumbo, an address that's actually the Polio Polio platform, when it posts that receiver has received an, a unique key and that reception has been confirmed, he can sign a transaction and withdraw the funds from this wallet. Or if I sign and after this date and not meaning that uh, if the recipient already confirmed receipt, then as a donor, I cannot get the product back because that means that the payment have to go to the shop. Right now, as we build the platform, we actually have a safety mechanism allowing the Polio Polio platform itself to withdraw after three months. So if neither the donor or the producer withdraws funds from this wallet, it could be due to a problem in, in the creation of, um, as it's a platform in development, we introduced this simply to prevent the complete loss of funds. Because that's, that's the, the, the danger of distributed ledgers. They are immutable. So if you don't handle all thinkable scenario, you might end up losing funds um, and they will be lost forever. But this condition is of course one that will be removed uh, once we are certain that uh, the, the, the- Gasper? Handling, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that uh, I'm conscious of the time. We have- a oh questions for you that have been already generated in the in the chat excellent excellent i'll just try the to make number of uh, questions uh, already stated there mm -hmm. i'm going to start uh, reading some of that i had um, which currencies can be used on the platform can there be fiat or any other cryptocurrency currently we have to uh, rely only on donations using bytes, which is the native currency of the Obyte platform. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a reason for that, for the time being at least. It is that uh, as we, we of course need to introduce the, the possibility to, to, uh, to make fiat donations. Uh, but to do so, it would require uh, a fiat to, to a crypto gateway. And that means that for a brief moment of, in, of time, the, the fiat currency will have to land on an account controlled by Polio Polio. Yes. And the moment that happens, we suddenly become a payment processor. And that raises a shitload of legal requirements uh, and licenses to obtain. We are working on, on, doing, on being able to, to do that. But the first and, and foremost thing needed is uh, a bank account. And in order to get a bank account, we need Polio Polio to be, um, to be registered as a legal charitable organization here in Denmark. So as soon as everything, and of course we need to wait for the lawmakers to, to create a, good, um, a framework that would allow uh, the establishment of a legal entity like Polio Polio okay. as a charitable okay. organization. What about crypto? Yeah. Could, could you take uh, any other type of uh, cryptocurrency? Uh, we will be able to. Uh, just, uh, I think it was last month, uh, the Obite platform introduced uh, autonomous agents. And, and it, it's basically the same as, as uh, Ethereum's smart contracts. Uh, it's, it's fully autonomous, it runs on chain. And by having on chain uh, uh, programs, so to speak, it allows us the ability to, to make conversions between different currencies uh, without touching them without getting any near them. Um, we really need to stay away from the donated funds for as long as we can, because the moment we somehow have access to, to donated funds, we run into all sorts of legal trouble. But the, the autonomous agents of Novide 
I, I will allow us to actually convert. So we just need more time and more developer resources to introduce uh, possibilities to make donations in other currencies as well. Let me ask another question. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we cannot uh, make any type of donations other than buy at this point, but then maybe in the future we will be able to perhaps uh, use uh, any other cryptocurrency. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a question on, uh, does the donor know who in the end um, was the, the donor knows who in the end received the donation? There yes. The, the, the recipient in the end. Yeah, they know, uh, they can see the recipient uh, on the platform. They click the donate button. Um, so they do it beforehand. Yeah, they, they can see all the, the open uh, applications. So when they find uh, an applicant that they think uh, this looks good, uh, I, I trust that this is a person that actually needs the product. The, 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 it's very important to stress that the applicants will never get anywhere near the funds. The funds is a matter between the donor and the provider of a physical product. So the, the applicants, they cannot get the funds. They can get a product. So if I sit in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden, for example, and I think, oh, I'm going to apply for a product provided by a bakery in Venezuela, then yes, uh, I could make that uh, application, but I would have to travel to Venezuela, to that specific bakery, to get my bread. I, will, I won't get money to pay for a bread. I will get the actual physical bread. So, so in that way, uh, there it's it's kind of difficult for applicants to cheat the system. Of course, Can they would have to to up with the a on that one. So, how, how is the process uh, for an applicant? Who decides that the that the applicant does qualify? I can actually show it. Uh, show it. Um, no, we don't have time for showing it. We don't have time for showing. Uh, you. We are short too. We applic have all applicants are allowed to apply for products. You create a profile. I am now uh, an applicant on the platform, and I can simply just go and apply for a product. I so have the list of products available. There's no assessment. As to there's no assessment. Everyone are allowed to make an application. Okay, so there's no particular. Okay, so then we have uh, Kirill who also asked, uh, how do you raise uh, actual donations? How do you make people donate money to? Uh, Right well, now, we were it's quite well. It's it's already outdated question, I think, because the answer was already provided. I would I would rather the question, well ask again the, the second part is that uh, you trusted parties. Yeah, who is a trusted party in Venezuela on site? That's exactly. it. Yes. Actually, I wanted you to tell a little bit of story around it, but we really are very short on time. Yeah. That this is all uh, very, very briefly. Uh, right now, we rely on the two students from the Simon Bolivar University. Uh, they know these shops and they are uh, actively uh, traveling around trying to onboard more shops. Um, but in theory, there's no, nothing that prevents any shop from participating. And we rely completely on transparency. So the donors will have to be uh, able to spot uh, potential fraud. So that's, uh, I think that it, in general, then we understand that you don't really need any resources to make the system work, but there is an, a component of education and awareness that will be then required in order to get started with this uh, project anywhere. Of course. And, and there's lots of things that we could still improve uh, to make the process simpler and easier for, for all three participating uh, roles, both the donors and the producers and the recipients. Um, there's, there's a lot of improvements that need to be made uh, before we can scale um, very big. So that, uh, that, that's, that has been very insightful. Thank you so, so much, Casper. Uh, You're it's welcome. Something very interesting that happened uh, to us in uh, Blockchain for Humanity, that we had two projects that were actually inspired you know, by Venezuela to do their own projects. And we just, uh, I know you just left us, but it was the same situation. She was moved by a movie or some kind of a video that she saw oh. about the situation in Venezuela. And at the same time, you said that you were moved about this article. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that does I, I, spark people's ideas to, to, you know, let me do something about this. There's, there's something really not fair 
happening Abs else. Can absolutely. Do yeah, and it's I guess it's it's uh, it's the universal thing when when you read about people in people that are suffering uh, and and there is uh, something that makes it easy for you to relate to that person. In in my case, it was that only two years uh, before I became a father myself. Uh, and I can, can't even start to imagine the pain those parents had to go through. So um, it, it really made me want to make a difference. Uh, That's wonderful. I just want to make a pause here because we are now on our 60 minutes. So we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated in our virtual gathering. Anyone who wants to stay, you're more than welcome. We will continue talking to Casper because there's uh, still a lot of stuff that we would love to ask him and get some details mm -hmm. on. So you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, we will see you in the next uh, two weeks. We will have another virtual meeting, so we'll send you all the details as well. So thank you. And let's continue. I'll, uh, just uh, one last, I'll be sending the link to the presentation so people can actually see it uh, online. It's a Google Slides uh, presentation, so people can see it there. We will follow Great. the link and, and share it with, uh, with everyone. So if, if you're not in our Telegram group, I will suggest you join us. Uh, the Blockchain for Humanity um, organization is in the Telegram, and we will post that link to the presentation there. So thank you so Great. much. Great. Thanks, Pat. All right. Good. I, I still have some questions for you. Fire away.